I'd like to dedicate this to all of the Creator's righteous children. I have some food in my bag for you. Not that edible food, the food you eat? No. I have some food for thought. Since knowledge is infinite, it has infinitely fell on me. So, um... Peace, folks. Welcome back to this podcast slash YouTube video. Today... I'm going to be talking about the one and only Mr. Drizzy Drake himself. Now, this video will have something to do with Drake, but more so will have to do with the television show that he was on for almost seven years called Degrassi. Now, the reason I'm bringing any of this up is because we all know that Drake has been in a public rap beef with Pusha T for like the past few weeks and all that anybody could talk about and everything has just been crazy around Drake. But the reason I even am bringing this up and bringing him into this conversation is because of the short film that he did after leaving Degrassi and making his first few mixtapes back in 2007. Before he got signed with Little Wayne, he had this short film that he attributes to the reason why he ended up in blackface and those pictures surfaced. And that's a conversation that I might talk about later in this recording. But for me, the reason I got back into Degrassi and I'm talking about this today is because of the short film that he did back in 2007 with the guy who played Declan. If you remember, if you're a Degrassi fan at all, which if you're here because you want to talk talk about and hear my commentary on the Drake and Pusha T rap beef from an actual hip hop standpoint, That's not actually what I'm going to be talking about today and is something that if you want to hear my commentary on, I might talk about it in a blog post. I have a blog, iceturtlegirl.blog, maybe in a small section on my blog or something like that, but I don't really have strong feelings about it one way or another. I am a huge hip hop fan, but that didn't really, you know, strike my fancy. I've never really been a rap beef type of hip hop fan, and so that never really sparked my interest. Um, But the reason I'm talking about Drake and Degrassi and all of that is because of that short film. And Degrassi was a show that you we all know Drake was on. You know he spawned the wheelchair Jimmy moniker after everything that went on with that, and just to explain Degrassi to the simple hip hop heads who never watched Degrassi and kind of fell in love with Drake just solely on his music and wasn't actually a fan of Aubrey Graham prior to that. Degrassi was a Canadian television show, kind of a teen drama-ish show that actually started back in the late 80s and early 90s. And that show actually was a groundbreaking show for teen sitcom dramedies. Now, The show was basically created by Linda Schuyler, and she created the show back actually in the late 70s. And it started with a show called Kids of Degrassi Street. And the whole point of the show in general that has happened from Kids of Degrassi Street to Degrassi Junior High to Degrassi High to Degrassi Next Generation and to the new class, which is on Netflix right now. The reason she created these shows in the first place is to help teach teenagers about different situations that go on in teenage life and so topics including pregnancy aids taking drugs um what else suicide death um you name it they talked about it right and so back to drake He was on the Degrassi The Next Generation for seven seasons. And that was kind of how I started to uh, know who Drake is. And that was before he actually became Drake as we know him today. He was Aubrey Graham, the actor on Degrassi, who played Jimmy Brooks, the basketball star with the popular best friends and who always got the girl and was just you know, the cool black kid on the show, which that's another topic I will be talking about uh, when it comes to race on Degrassi. But he was a popular kid on the show. He basically just, you know, was popular. He was the only black guy on the show and, you know, we cool. So he was a cool kid. 
Um, it wasn't until season four that things started to take a turn with his character. So, if you've never seen Degrassi, you might have actually seen one episode that kind of spawned the whole wheelchair Jimmy thing and why people uh, talk about Drake in the way that they talk about him when it comes to his acting. There's an episode during season four called Time, Ta- Time Stand Still. It's a two-part episode. Now, there's a bunch of episodes that lead up to this episode, um, even back to season three, that you should go back and watch. And there's actually a really great, somebody who's awesome decided to make a little mini movie out of all the episodes leading up to Time Stand Still and the episodes afterwards that have anything to do with that episode. Because it's a very big story arc and plays a lot with a lot of things that are actually going on today in high schools as we speak. It was their school shooting episode, and when I say it was very, very moving, it was very moving. So basically, the whole premise of that episode, that two-parter, is there's this kid named Rick Murray. Rick Murray was this nobody who nobody really knew until this episode in season three. There was this girl named Terry McGregor, and she's best friends with Paige, and she's part of Jimmy's like cool kid um, group, right? And... Basically, she starts to fall in love with Rick, but Rick is very abusive. Now, we never actually meet Rick's parents except for his mom, and we never get to meet his dad. But assuming he must have had a very hard childhood, and his dad could have been very abusive to him because he was very abusive to Terry. Very, very abusive. Now, not as abusive as a character from the 80s version of Degrassi. His name was Scott. And he was dating a girl in that show. And he was even more physically abusive than Rick was ever to Terry. But we'll get into that later. Basically, Rick basically put Terry into a coma. And she had to switch schools, right? And so he leaves school that year. He comes back the next year and people are livid. They are so mad that he didn't get any prosecutions for what he did. They're mad that he got off scot-free and then he's coming back to be a part of their school. Now, Rick actually tells the kids at school that he is going to therapy, anger management, and all that type of stuff. And he's trying to figure out his life and figure it out. They can't handle that. They're mad because he put her in a coma and he is just getting away with it scot-free. So they bully him relentlessly for you know months and months and months leading up to time to end still they have a campaign where they wear little orange ribbons and basically try to push him out of school so time stand still happens and jimmy and spinner who is jimmy's best friend are relentless to him they are bullies to the max they hate him so much And rightfully so, because, of course, Spinner, the year before, with his girlfriend at the time, Paige, actually found Terry in the woods when he, Rick had gotten really pissed off at Terry and pushed her into some bricks, which, why there are bricks in the woods, we will never know. But he, that's the reason why he put him, put her into a coma, and Rick, I mean, and Spinner and Paige were actually the ones who found, uh, Terry in the woods, Uh, lying there with blood coming out of her head and rick is standing there and then he runs away so rightfully so Paige, spinner and jimmy are very furious with rick and what happened so they bully him and bully him and bully him there's this contest that goes on oh and fat and rewind there's this kid named toby who is kind of a dork to say the least And he's best friends with this kid named JT, and that'll come into play later. But he's best friends with this kid named JT, and, you know, he's just a dork. And JT sort of stops being friends with him for one reason or another. And so Toby ends up being friends with Rick because, well, who else are you going to be friends with? The local dork, of course. And so that comes into play during uh, Time Stand Still. So basically, in that episode, to speed things along, there's this whack your brain contest, which is basically like one of those academic bowls that uh, schools uh, basically play in and they're broadcast on TV and, you know, you're smart, you have to go against the school or whatever and blah, blah, blah. So Jimmy ends up being a part of that and 
actually starts to see that Rick is actually human and starts to sort of take a liking to him in a small way. At least he says he's not going to bully him anymore and if anybody tries to, he will beat them up. Which I found to be very admirable and really a uh, showing of Jimmy's character. So basically the Whack Your Bowl contest happens and Emma, who is another character that basically is the reason why Jurassic Next Generation actually started in the first place, um, Toby and Rick and Jimmy are all on one team. And they actually end up winning the bowl. But what happens is Spinner and Jay Hogart and Alex Nunez, uh, the local thugs basically at school, um, devise this plan to pour paint and feathers all over Rick once he wins. That was horrible. And Rick gets furious about it. So he goes home and he gets his family's gun. Why they have a gun and they don't have it locked up is ridiculous to me. And why he has was able to go get a gun and bring it to school was crazy to me. But that happens. Um, so he does that. He goes to school and he just goes on a shooting rampage. The first person he does is Jimmy because when he's in the bathroom cleaning up, he overhears Spinner and Jay, who know that Rick is in there, basically tell him that uh, Jimmy was behind the paint and feathers and lie to, lie to him, basically. And that gets Jimmy shot and put in that wheelchair. And then he also tries to shoot Emma, but that's for a different reason, and basically ends up getting killed. So basically for seasons five, six, and seven, Jimmy's just in this wheelchair and basically that just defines his character for the next three seasons because what else are you going to do with his character? Then he tries to figure out how to like become a basketball star again, but he can't do that. He tries to, you know, have art be his outlet that works for a moment and then he does music. And that I feel like season seven when he decided to do more of his musical chops because he. See, he had friends who had been in a band called Downtown Sasquatch, and he had been the bassist of that band for a long time. And was it the bassist or the guitarist? I can't remember. Either, regardlessly, he was in that band, but he was playing an instrument. Season seven, he decides he's going to do the rap thing, and he starts rhyming, which is cool. I was into it back then. And I feel like that was sort of his exit stage left I'm going to become a hip hop star and the rest is really history from there. We all know how Drake got up, but a lot of people in this whole Pusha T and Drake beef kind of at first were like Drake was the winner, but when Pusha T came back with everything, Drake had to explain a lot of things and basically it made you have to go back and think like, Drake didn't really come from this hip-hop thing, you know what I mean? It's cool that he liked hip-hop back in the day, but he wasn't from these hip-hop streets. And that's something that a lot of people seem to forget. Drake isn't from that life. He's from Canada, and by the time he was like 13, he was already making money because he was on Degrassi. And so it's like, you know, he was always making money his whole life. He lived in a very comfortable middle-class family, and even though his dad and his mom got divorced early on in his life and his dad pretty much left him, he lived with his Jewish mom, his Jewish white mom, and, you know, he basically lived comfortably because of Degrassi. And so, you know, say what you want about all of those things, but Drake didn't come from that life, and that just is what it is. But enough about that. I really wanted to talk about Degrassi as a whole, um, I've recently, because of Drake, and I blame him solely, I started to go back and rewatch some Degrassi episodes from different time periods in the Degrassi universe. And I, for some reason, decided to, just decided to go back and watch some of the 80s episodes. And something I want to talk about that has a lot to do with Degrassi the Next Generation, and I'm not sure about Next Class because I'm too old to watch that show. At this point, I don't even know why I'm talking about Degrassi, but I'm like 26, so I've pretty much grown out of Degrassi completely. But the reason I'm talking about this is because of Drake and the race card that never really got played in Degrassi. What I mean by that is in The Next Generation, Drake, Jimmy Brooks, 
And Liberty Van Zant, who was this under, like, they were in eighth grade, season one, and Liberty was in seventh grade. And basically, those were the only two black kids, except for when Liberty's brother starts to go to Degrassi. Those were the only black kids in the school. There were absolutely no other black kids in the school. You can count Hazel, but she's not really, um, like, she's not really, like, you know, North American black she's actually Somalian which you can count her you can but for the most part those were the only black kids there were never really any black representation on the show except for a few characters and for the most part being black never played a role in their characters and I'm not saying that it should have like I'm not saying that that was a big deal that they should have but I do feel like it was important that they talk about racism and things that go on with black characters Um, and black people in general I know it's a Canadian show so they don't deal with race the same way we do in America and I feel like if that show had been made in America they could have dealt with the race issue a lot more and I feel like it did a disservice once Degrassi started playing in the United States it kind of did a disservice to their black audience who there was a black audience who watched the show and that's why a lot of people you know were kind of not forced because you know Jimmy's a good character but I feel like a lot of black kids who watch Degrassi, if you didn't like really relate with a lot of other characters, you were definitely going to relate with Jimmy only because he's black. And I feel like that was really doing a disservice to his character and to Degrassi as a whole. But then I went back and watched more of Degrassi Junior High and Degrassi High, the 80s versions of Degrassi. And I learned that back then they really were talking about race in a okay it's the 80s so they were talking about it in not a very substantial way but at least they were talking about it you know for Degrassi Next Generation it took them at least eight to nine years for them to even talk about that issue and you know I heard that um, in the next class they actually did a episode on Black Lives Matter which is a stepping stone for Degrassi on you know racial issues but Something I really liked about Degrassi Junior High and Degrassi High was that there were a lot more people of color in that show and those shows than there were in Degrassi The Next Generation by a long shot. You know what I mean? There were Asian characters, black characters, you know, Muslim characters. What else? Who else was in there? Like a bunch of different characters. And, you know, it is Canada and Canada, like United States, can be a melting pot. But at least they were talking about these issues that were going on with characters. And even if not, they were at least existing in the show in a tangible way that they could at least show, okay, these are black characters. You know what I mean? And I feel like with The Next Generation, that was really they were just really doing a disservice to the show by not really talking about the whole I'm black. You know what I mean? Like that shouldn't be something that's so overtly there but it still should be talked about in some type of way um back to the Degrassi junior high and Degrassi high the two story arcs that I kind of got really entangled with for some reason um was Spike who plays Emma Nelson's mom in the next generation and uh Caitlin Ryan who uh dated Joy Jeremiah who was Craig's stepdad um with with spike's character we have her whole pregnancy storyline now the reason i went back and watched that was because growing up i did watch the grassy next generation like i said and there's an episode during season three of the next generation called father figures part one and two and it's where emma goes to discover her birth father because at the beginning of season one Spike is a single mom, raising Emma on her own, and season two, she gets married to Snake, another student who went to uh, Degrassi Junior High and Degrassi High with Spike, and they were in the same class, and they get married, and become he becomes Emma's stepdad, but we never really hear anything about her father until that episode, season three, and it puts a lot of things in perspective, but I wanted to go back and kind of watch that whole storyline unfold because there's a lot of things being told in that episode that I guess would make sense but it's better to watch it because I feel like you get a better perspective of really what went on 
So basically, Spike is this character who, the reason I call her Spike is because she has big spiky hair and she's a punk rock kid and she loves Sid Vicious and Billy Idol and a bunch of other punky new wave type bands, right? And it's really cool. She basically gets pregnant by this guy named Shane McKay, who was this popular kid in their gl- in their grade, right? And she gets pregnant, and they have to deal with the consequences of her being pregnant. Now, what happens is that originally she decided she wanted to get, a, get an abortion. It comes across her brain for like two seconds, and then she's like, no, I don't think so. I'm going to have this baby. And what I think is really great about Spike's story um, contrary to other stories they've had on teen pregnancy, is that Spike's mom, being a teen mom herself, having Spike when she was 17, is very aware of what it takes to be a teen mom. And so she's very, very, very supportive of her daughter. And something I really appreciate about that whole storyline is that she's able to be there for her daughter when she needs her, right? And I really believe that that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And I really took that to heart because I felt like that was was just really great. Like, you're, and the thing was is that Spike was the youngest kid to ever have a baby on Degrassi because she was only 14. Imagine having a kid at 14. That's crazy. You know, by the time that she was Emma's mom that we see in season one of Degrassi, the next generation, she's like only, you know, She's, like, only in her 20s, maybe her 30s, like, very early 30s. Like, it's crazy. It's really, really crazy that she's only in her early to mid-20s um, when Emma is, like, 14 or 13 or 12, something like that. Um, But basically, with Spike, you know, she has Emma, and then she basically, Shane McKay tries to be a part of their lives, but really can't sustain that because he's a teenage boy. What do you want? And so at first she tries to pay child support to Spike, which is great, but it doesn't work out in the end because Shane does something really idiotic and stupid and takes acid and basically ruins his life and jumps off a building or something like that. And basically sustains injuries to the point where he now has a learning disability and is basically part of a special needs uh, part of life and can't basically function with his own life anymore. And it really sucks because, you know, Spike and Shane really are only together for five minutes. And that's something I have a problem with with Degrassi. Um junior high and Degrassi high is that they have these relationships where they have people together but they only have certain relationships be together for like five minutes and then they'll just have that be the offshoot for some other type of storyline they want to present on the show like Shane and Spike were only together for like five minutes perceived on camera of course and then they have sex and she gets pregnant and all this stuff happens but You know, they're never together for longer than it takes for them to have another plot point be presented in the story. And, you know, they do that same thing with another character, uh, Caitlin Ryan, and another character, his name was Claude. Claude? Cloud? I don't really know. Anyways, basically, Caitlin Ryan and this Claude person end up together. They're together for five minutes. They're both really, like, activists into the environment. They love foreign films. They're, like, protest babies. It's really cute. They're together. They go to this warehouse or this factory where they're doing nuclear testing, right? And both Claude and Caitlin are against it. And so they decide to go there and basically spray paint the walls saying that nukes are terrible or whatever. And... The cops end up finding them and they try to get away. And then because there's like a barbed wire uh, between outside of the factory and inside of the factory, um, they have to climb over. Claude gets totally over the fence and Caitlin gets stuck. And so when she asks for his help, he runs away. Now, this comes in later uh, when she has to actually go to court because Caitlin gets caught and she has to go to court. 
he gets really mad at Claude for not speaking up for her and not um, helping to save her. But Claude says that his parents are not as liberal as Caitlin's. And that being said, we get to see Caitlin's mom and how Caitlin's mom talks about how when she was a kid, she used to protest too. And, you know, all this stuff. And she's really liberal and really cool. And Claude says his parents are not like that. And that they're very hard and very conservative and wouldn't be as forgiving as Caitlin's would. And, he w- and that they would probably throw him out of the house. Caitlin still gets mad at him, and rightfully so, because you shouldn't have left her. You shouldn't have left her. And making her go to court by herself is just wrong. But at the same time, I sort of understand where he's coming from, because if your parents are that conservative and that hard, I wouldn't want to see them, you know, do something to you that would potentially damage you for life. But what happens is that they break up, and Claude actually does something that damages him for life. The next season, because this is one season during Degrassi High, and the next season, you see Claude again during this talent show. And basically, they're having this talent show, and everything's going fine, and blah, blah, blah. But he decides to um, do this monologue. And it's a very dark and very depressing monologue about death. And basically, the kids who are putting on this talent show tell him that it's too much it's not lighthearted enough and that basically it sucks and he gets really pissed at them and yells at them and all this stuff and one of Claude's friends tries to console him and actually find out what's going on with him and why he's so down and depressed because she's been in that situation before and he says that she's just being nice and that she can't help him and you know basically he tries to get back with Caitlin Caitlin's basically like I don't want to be with you go away you're annoying And so he basically brings her this white rose and tries one more time. And she just basically says, get out of my face. You're annoying. Go away. And he says, okay, goodbye. And we see him not go to his class. We see him take out a gun from his backpack in his locker. And we see him walk into the guy's restroom. Now, next, uh, Snake, who becomes Emma Nelson's stepdad in The Next Generation, He basically, um, you know, he finds him in the bathroom and basically he has irreparable consequences in his mental psyche thanks to this because he has to see the dead body on the floor. It's a very emotional episode that you should go watch. It's called uh, something about a play. I can't remember the exact um actual uh name title for it but it has something to do with play so go go find it but basically um spike our snake finds the body and he gets sent home and he doesn't come back to school for like weeks and it also tell takes a toll on caitlin because she feels guilty about not getting back with him she feels guilty about him killing himself killing himself because she feels like it was because of her now i feel like it was partly because of her but also it was actually because of his bad home life and how horrible things were going for him at home and i feel like that combined with caitlin not wanting to be with him just led him down a path of horribleness and he just ended up offing himself and i felt like that was really really sad now that was the very first time that degrassi had ever actually talked about or mentioned or shown a suicide at degrassi or anywhere around degrassi they wouldn't actually have another suicide episode until around season, I don't know if it was season 12 or 13, but the time season 10 of Degrassi happened, I was too old and I couldn't, I just, I didn't, I didn't have an interest in Degrassi anymore and I kind of just fell off the wagon of watching that show anymore. But basically, I think it was either season three, 13, 12, could have been 11, I really don't know, but they had this character named cameron or cam and i think he had bipolar disorder and he ends up killing himself and kind of the way that caitlin felt really bad about the way claude killed himself because she felt like it was her fault um cameron had this girlfriend i don't remember her name but basically you can look all this stuff up on youtube basically she feels really bad i think about the way that he killed himself that cam killed himself 
And I feel like that was two storylines that were, you know, very big on Degrassi and very emotional and but very needed to talk about because there are kids out there that feel that way all the time. Um, another storyline that Degrassi, the next generation, uh, talks about a lot and besides pregnancy and sex and, you know, whatever, they talk about self-harm. The first episode that I watched that they talked about self-harming was about Ellie Nash. Ellie Nash was your typical punk rock goth girl. Season two, she comes into the picture and she becomes friends with Ashley Kerwin. Ashley Kerwin dated Jimmy Brooks season one. See, it all comes back to Drake. Anyways, by season two, she's this social outcast and starts hanging out with Ellie and becoming all goth and whatever. Um, which actually wasn't that far fetched from her character because deep down I could feel that she was an emo kid from Jump Street. So, anyways, season two, she starts hanging out with Ellie, and Ellie's this cool character. I really liked her season two, and I really liked the way she dressed, and she was really cool. Season three, she starts wearing black like it's her life force black, 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 touches of red, but mostly black, touches of pink, but mostly black, touches of purple, mostly black. You get the picture. And the reason that she starts dressing really, 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 really goth and really, like, black and really, like, dark is because she's going through a lot in her life. The reason being, her mom is an alcoholic. Her dad just shipped off to Iraq at the time or Afghanistan, one of the two. And she is stuck, left home with her alcoholic, abusive mother who doesn't take care of her and just expects Ellie to take care of herself, fend for herself, and doesn't even deal with the repercussions that Ellie has to deal with. I mean, this wouldn't happen until the next season, but there's actually an episode, season four, where Ellie's mom is so intoxicated to the point where they, she almost burns down their house. Burns down their house. It's crazy. Um, but this all leads Ellie to cut herself. And it's a really sad very open, very emotional, very moving, very much needed uh, depiction of something that many, many, many adolescent youth deal with all the time. And I feel like they really did hit a uh, mark on talking about this issue because it was an issue that needed to be talked about a lot because of the rate of kids doing it. And they depicted it well. Um, being gay, the LGBTQIA plus community, they talk about that a lot. The first person, and I'm sure there were people in Degrassi Junior High and Degrassi High. I'm actually in the process of watching more episodes from those seasons. So I don't actually know all of the storylines I talked about during those times, but I plan to keep watching those. So, but you can go and watch all of the Degrassi series from... Degrassi Junior High, Degrassi High, The Next Generation, on up. And you can watch The Next Class on Netflix. And you can basically um, find all these topics and episodes on YouTube and on Netflix. But basically, um, the first gay person they talked about from Degrassi The Next Generation was Marco Del Rossi. And basically, Marco Del Rossi, first of all, can I just say something? I personally, and this is before Adamo, the actor who played Marco Del Rossi, came out as a gay man. He played Marco Del Rossi and hadn't come out yet, so there was a chance that he was straight just playing a gay guy. I had a big crush on Adamo. I really, really did. And I regret that now that I did not see that the actor was just as gay as the character not to say that he couldn't have been like he could have been a straight guy playing a gay guy but he played marco really really well i should have known i should have known but i was young and when i was watching those episodes back in the day i was like 13 and that was really the first time i was hearing about gay people in general so what did i actually know nothing so anyways back to marco anyways they did his storyline so well when he comes out to his best friend spinner and Spinner can't deal with it. And then he ends up getting gay bashed in the park. 
and Jimmy has to come and find him. It's all very moving. He tries to date Ellie season two. Can't work because he's gay. And he has to come to terms with that. It's a lot. It's a lot. But it's all very well and great and amazing. But the storyline that I like to talk about, you know, you have Marco, then you have Paige and Alex, Palix, who basically were this lesbian couple, but also uh, Paige was bisexual. So there was like a lot to unpack with that. And then you had Adam Torres, who I think came out, came into the show either season 10, 11, or 12. I cannot remember because I didn't watch those seasons. But basically, he was the transgender uh, character of the show. Something that I thought was really great. Something that I thought they really uh, should have done a lot earlier. But that was around the time that they started to talk about this thing. I think because of, you know, the Vern Cox being in Orange is the New Black and the whole conversation around that and just transgender people becoming more of a focal point in the LGBTQIA plus experience, they were able to talk about it more. And I felt like that was really great. Um, I've heard that in the next class, they've talked about gender queer and non-binary people and they're really doing more with the lgbtqia plus experience than they sh- could have back in the original degrassi or even degrassi next generation which i think is great and wonderful and amazing um yeah degrassi has talked about so many issues so many important issues that i'm just in awe of that show you know what i mean yes the acting was campy Yes, the storylines could borderline be kind of weird. And yes, the show was, you know, very Canadian. Let's be real. Um, But we wouldn't have Drake today without this show. And I just feel like this show deserves more praise than it gets a lot of the time. You know, a lot of people just look at it as the show that helped to catapult Drizzy Drake into the hip hop world, which is true. That is 100 percent true. But we have to talk about Degrassi as a whole and Degrassi as a show, you know what I mean? I feel like sometimes it gets a bad rep for just being what it is. But I feel like I learned a lot from that show, just being who I am as a person. I mean, I feel like a lot of who I am as a person wasn't fully represented on that show as a whole. But I do feel like it taught me a lot of lessons about other people's experiences going through other different situations. And there were some times where I could relate, but most of the time, not so much. But I got to learn more about other people's situations and experiences on the show. And I feel like that was really a teaching moment for me as I grew into my adolescent self and helped me to learn more about different people's experiences in high school. So I do give Degrassi a lot of credit, a lot of props. And thank you to Linda Schuyler for keeping this important, important show alive for all of these years. And yeah, I mean, if you want to go back and watch it from the original standpoint, um, I'm not actually sure if they have the Degra- kids of Degrassi Street on um, YouTube, but if they do, check it out. Check out Degrassi Junior High. De- t- check out Degrassi High. Check out Schools Out, which was um, their feature length film, their only film that they ever actually did for De- uh, the original Degrassi, the 80s Degrassi. Um, and that show, uh, that movie actually was, it wasn't in theaters or anything, but it was, it was just like their big like one hour special type thing or few hours special type thing and it's important because it has a lot of correlation to a lot of storylines that happen um in degrassi next generation and something i want to talk about is seasons one two and three of degrassi next generation are very much mimicking a lot of the storylines that happened seasons in in a lot of the seasons in degrassi junior high and degrassi high it wasn't until after the shooting in D- season four that Degrassi really takes a turning point. Um, Degrassi the Next Generation really takes a turning point and starts to talk about other subjects they might not have talked about in Degrassi Junior High and Degrassi High. And they also uh, start to just develop their own storylines, own character development, own everything. And so it's not as copycat-ish as the first three seasons were. But, I mean... They did their thing and they had to play off something, you know what I mean? So I appreciate that show for what it did and 
the lessons it taught me, the how it helped me to become a more compassionate person in my life and see different viewpoints of how the world goes round, you know what I mean? And so I definitely do recommend the show to any teenagers and even young adults in their 20s uh, going through life, you know what I mean? Um, and I do think that because of Degrassi, we would never have Jersey Drake. And because of that, we're better off for it. He can... He is a flawed person, let's be real, but who isn't? Who isn't? You know what I mean? And, you know, like I said, yes, he did do a film, 2007, with the guy who played Declan, seasons 6 and 7 of Degrassi and Next Generation, and it wasn't a very good film. It was very campy. It was very... um, trying to sell a point that doesn't need to necessarily did not need to be there and let's just you know drake was in blackface and he can't really take that back and he can try to explain it up his butt but he cannot take that back and that's something that a lot of drake fans i feel like because a lot of drake fans are not black will try to explain away kind of like the whole kanye west thing a lot of people who are not black who are kanye fans will try to just erase the fact that he said that slaves slavery is a choice erase the fact that he wore a maga hat and his best friend with donald trump they'll just try to erase all these issues and still listen to his album and that's something i can't do um because i work for the justice and betterment of my people and i will not sell them out for an album but with drake same thing you know i can't just sell out my people because drake makes good music i mean yes i'm still gonna listen to drake's music i think that's just gonna happen i haven't really been a drake fan for a very long time when he was still in degrassi and he was making his little mixtapes and stuff i thought it was really awesome and i listened to it and i listened to a lot of his music up to like 2010 I was into Drake and I was really a fond, fond of him. But that was because I was a fan of Aubrey Graham as the actor. And so I feel like because I was so big into Aubrey Graham as the actor that I um, just decided that I was going to like his music too. And it wasn't until after 2010, around 2013, 14, 15, 16, well actually 2013 I sort of liked his music still. But after that it sort of just... I couldn't, I didn't, I wasn't me, and I just didn't like it anymore. And there's been, you know, a few songs here and there, but I'm not a Drake fan. Like, I'm not a Drake fan fan anymore. I'm not even a Drake stan. I could never be a Drake stan. But I'm just not into it like that anymore. And so as much as I will always have a soft spot for Drake, you know, Aubrey Graham as Jimmy Brooks and Aubrey Graham the actor... I don't think I can say the same for his music. And, you know, I did do a reaction video to his song, Nice For What, which I do like, I'm not going to lie. And there have been a few songs over the years that I like, and I still like a lot of his um, early work. But I'm not going to say that I'm a Drake fan. And so him coming out in blackface was really a slap in the face to a lot of people. And I understand why. And I understand why there needs to be a wider conversation about Drake and what he represents in hip hop and in black culture in general. Because, you know, he's Canadian. He's not actually American black. And, you know, I'm 100% certain that Canadian blacks see the world a very different way than american blacks do and that's just is what it is i mean that's how it is with black people from all over the diaspora we all see and have a different experience being a black person in this world and i just feel like drake does not understand fully the effects of jim crow the effects of blackface and the effects of racism on black americans and that just is what it is and so that's why i feel like he could not relate fully to why being in blackface was such a big blow to a lot of black people because it is and i don't think he understands that fully and so he can explain it away all he wants to but that's still something he's just never gonna fully understand and i feel like also not to throw you know being biracial under the bus because there are a lot of biracial hip-hop artists logic j cole a bunch of them that actually are more you know black in the sense of the way they represent out there in the world than drake will ever be and that's not his fault 
that's not his fault he just is it is what it is you know what i mean so you know yeah so if you're a degrassi fan let me know your favorite episodes your favorite moments and if you're not and you just you know are here because drake is drake then you should go back and watch his storylines on degrassi it will help you a lot even though he's playing a character named jimmy brooks and he's not actually playing opry graham or drake in some ways it does follow his story because if you look at the similarities between drake you know aubrey graham as a person and jimmy brooks there are some similarities there and so um i definitely recommend checking out his storyline from season one to season seven there's a lot to unpack but it's important and i feel like it'll help you uh kind of uh see the whole blackface thing for what it is and also something else i think people should go and watch is a movie called bamboozled or hollywood shuffle and those are two depictions of blackface from a black person doing it and it will teach you why this still is wrong from even a black person's perspective because like the n-word which i have a problem with it doesn't matter you can try to pretend like wearing blackface or saying the n-word or anything like that is taking back the power from the racist who made that thing a bad thing for you and hurtful it won't it's still gonna be hurtful no matter who does it it's still hurtful so anyways this was just my two cents on drake on degrassi and on just this whole situation as a whole i will probably do another degrassi video or another degrassi blog post on my blog ice turtle girl dot blog to talk more in depth about degrassi and what it means to me and some of my favorite characters and storylines and all that jazz but this was just a quick little you know my two cents on everything going on so yeah whatever it takes uh 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 i know i can make it through ooh 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 if i hold it up if i do i know i can make it through uh 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 be the best be the best that I can. And I will say to you whatever it takes. I know I can make it. I know I can make it. I know I can make it through. Yeah, I used to be at a grassy stand. Let's not play. All right, it's been real. Peace and blessings.